So in these next two lectures, I'm going to do a quick overview of the two major parties that we have today, the Democratic and Republican parties. I'm going to talk about their evolution. Now, um, what I'm not going to do is give you a comprehensive treatment on the development of these two parties over the course of the last one and a half to two centuries. The reading does a really good job of tracking the different party systems and the role and positions of the parties uh, uh, during those. One of the things to note about the evolution of both the Democratic and the Republican parties is that, in my view anyway, and this is what I'm going to explore in these two lectures, um, while the positions and platform and the specific policies have varied um, from uh, sort of decade, not decade to decade, but from era to era, uh, so that the Democratic Party uh, at one point stood for something that then completely stood for the opposite, and the same thing in the Republican Party, uh, on policy, there's been movement and change. And of course, you would expect that as the country develops from, you know, a largely agrarian, uh, um, uh, isolated nation to an increasingly industrial, increasingly interdependent, and then superpower uh, nation, which is extremely connected to and important in the global economy. Of course, policies are going to evolve and positions are going to change. What has, in my view, remained largely the same is the, is the spirit, the general spirit and orientation of each of the parties. Who the, each party thinks represents the core of the American people. Who are the true Americans uh, is one of the, I would say, questions that helps us to understand the different uh, um, party orientations and why we have two parties and why they've sort of uh, 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 battled on particular policies all along. Um, so I'm going to trace the evolution of the Democratic Party in this particular election, and I want to note that the sort of soul, the spirit of the Democratic Party has remained the same. Now, I almost said the word soul because uh, their spirit and soul are terms that are used interchangeably. One of the future lectures after these two uh, surveys of the two major parties is battling for the soul of, of the party. I'm going to talk about how that's a sort of normal dynamic uh, within each of the major parties and has been all along. Uh, essentially, the spirit of each party remains the same and then particular members of those parties are battling for the soul of it. In other words, for control over really more specifically what it means to be the representative of that particular spirit. Um, and I'll get into that in the lecture after the evolution of the, of the Republican Party. So, enough for preface, into the evolution of the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party really owes its specific origin to Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren, who are the ones who founded the, um, what you could call the Jacksonian Democratic Party, the modern Democratic Party in the late 1820s. But it, also, it owes really its existence and its spirit, its orientation, to the uh, partisan debates of the 1790s where Thomas Jefferson and James Madison formed the Democratic, Republican, or Jeffersonian Democratic, or whatever, as I indicated last time, whatever the name of that party would, uh, would be. It's been tagged different things because there was never really an official party name. Uh, the modern Democratic Party, the Jacksonian Party, owes its spirit and its basic orientation to that first party clash between the Federalists and the Jeffersonian, Madisonian, Democratic, Republicans, whatever you choose to call them. Um, and here's why. The Federalists were the party that saw the true Americans as merchants, bankers, investors, traders. Not to say that people who weren't those uh, members of those groups weren't true Americans, but they saw American uh, um, development and growth and progress and prosperity as tied fundamentally to those groups. Uh, to essentially the rising capitalist class and the drivers of uh, capitalist innovation, capitalist investment, capitalist development. Uh, the Federalists saw the future America as a capitalist industrial powerhouse. Now, spoiler alert, which you probably already know, they were right um, in terms of what America did become. In the 1790s, uh, as capitalism was really kind of forming and as the Industrial Revolution was really just kind of gathering itself, um, and uh, most of the important uh, technological and societal transformations would be a generation uh, away from the 1790s, uh, that the idea that America should be a capitalist industrial power, that the uh, traders, merchants, bankers, uh, industrialists uh, uh, were the lifeblood of America was connected to that vision. So who are the true Americans? was really answered as a question that was a sort of normative question. Who should the true Americans be? Who should we look to to be driving the future of America? 
And really, that question organizes the two great parties for the 200 plus years that America has been experimenting with democracy. Who should be the driving force of America's future? To Jefferson and Madison, the driving force of America's future was the driving force of what America's past and present were, which were, um, it, the term that they used was yeoman farmers. A yeoman is essentially a middle class, largely self-sufficient, modest uh, um, farmer who more or less takes care of himself, his family, is also deeply connected to the community, is deeply connected to the land, um, is civically engaged, uh, a yeoman farmer is the ideal. And so while we don't really have a lot of yeoman farmers left, and in fact by the middle of the 19th century and definitely by the beginning of the 20th century, the yeoman farmer was more or less gone, the general orientation that the Jeffersonian Madisonians had towards Americans was that regular, hardworking, modest, proud, individualistic people were the driving force of America. They, the regular Americans. It, to, to be kind of blunt about it, to the Federalists, the economic elites were the driving force, and to the Jeffersonian Madisonians, the regular average American were the driving force. The Democratic Party's spirit has always been oriented towards, and I'll air quote this, regular Americans. Uh, in, in other words, to just uh, common folks working hard, taking care of their families, having modest aspirations, trying to live out the, whatever version of the American dream, but not... Uh, seeking riches, not seeking power, not seeking fame, really just being uh, modest, humble, hardworking, proud, independent, largely self-sufficient Americans. Now, that broad description can fit a lot of different groups, and uh, over the course of America's development, that, that description would fit different people. By the late 19th century, that uh, description fit uh, industrial workers much better than it fit yeoman farmers. Uh, and so the Democratic Party's orientation towards the electorate shifted around and developed and moved. Um, and that's actually one of the things that parties, that, that, that drives the evolution of parties, is they're always seeking to, one, expand their electoral coalition, um, but two, to make sure that their orientation is aligned with the basic group of Americans that uh, that sort of represent the spirit that the party itself embodies. So the Democratic Party, for uh, lack of a better term, and to, to uh, simplify at the risk of, of oversimplifying, is the party of the regular Americans. The Federalists were the party of, they didn't call themselves the party of the elites, but they called themselves the party of sort of, uh, they could have been called the party of the innovators, the investors. Uh, you can probably see that the Republican Party has largely, uh, and I'll talk about this in the next lecture, but has largely embodied the spirit of uh, the uh, economic elites or the business class or the innovators, the investors, um, not the regular Americans. And the idea for the Federalists was not that the rest of Americans are worthless but that the rest of Americans get brought up, get pulled along, get their prosperity uh, ensured, the, get progress for them, get a high standard of living. Their happiness, their satisfaction is driven by the innovators, the investors, the, 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 the traders, the bankers, the uh, makers. Um, and to the Democratic Party, the, uh, America belongs to the people who actually are the, the vast bulk, the regular Americans. Now, Jefferson and Madison, interestingly, um, after the demise of the Federalist Party, what happens to the Democratic-Republican Party is that um, the Federalist Party goes away. And for a brief period, there is a, we have a one-party system. It's sometimes called the era of good feelings, even though there were, of course, always animosities. And the reason it's called the era of good feelings is there wasn't a fundamental partisan clash. There weren't two parties competing for power. With one party, uh, and with the Jefferson, Madison uh, folks in power, there actually turned out to be a drift in the direction of the Federalist position. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, when he becomes president, actually begins to embrace, or if not philosophically, at least in terms of his action, some of the positions of the uh, uh, Federalists. For example, he comes in with this f philosophical view on the Constitution that it ought to be narrowly tailored and that only explicit powers ought to be exercised and the president ought to have a small role and the federal government ought to take a backseat to the state governments. Yet, he took actions once he was in the big chair that 
uh, partook of a more expansive uh, interpretation of the U.S. Constitution. He went ahead and bought the Louisiana Territory without informing Congress, without asking for the money. He went and sent American Marines and Naval Forces to the Mediterranean to fight uh, or what, would, uh, what were called pirates at the time, Barbie pirates, which were really terrorists, to secure American trade routes to Europe without informing Congress, without asking for permission. So he himself embraced uh, positions that were intended to forward American power, uh, get things done. You know, he, he wanted to buy the Louisiana Territory because that was a great place for yeomen to go. It was actually oriented towards the yeoman farmers. But he used presidential power in a way that betrayed, I think, really clearly betrayed his principles. Um, for the Jeffersonian Madisonians, principles kind of took a backseat to pragmatic questions of policy. Madison himself, during the 1790s, during the debate with uh, the Hamiltonian Federalists about uh, chartering a, a Bank of the United States to be a centralized federal economic management force to help develop our uh, industrial capitalist economy, Madison was a huge opponent of that. So was Jefferson. Um, after or during the War of 1812, Madison, as president, actually uh, lobbied Congress successfully to recharter the Bank of the United States, the very bank that he had fought against in the 1790s, because as president and as a wartime president and as a reconstruction president trying to rebuild uh, the economy after the War of 1812, he saw the benefit of a federally uh, chartered uh, bank uh, and of federal guidance of uh, economic policy. Um, the, basically what happens to the elites within the Jeffersonian Madisonian party is that gradually uh, and pragmatically they embrace f mo most Federalist policies uh, and even their sort of interpretation of the Constitution probably because the Federalists were actually ahead of their time. They saw the direction the country was going. They saw what would be beneficial. They saw industrialization as being this implacable force. And uh, the, uh, they saw America rising in power and, and importance. And Jefferson and Madison and then James Monroe, who, who succeeded Madison, they were interested in continuing to promote American power, American independence, American security and prosperity. And they, they saw that on a policy kind of uh, basis, it was going to be beneficial to follow that Federalist path. So what happens is that there's a Federalist drift within the elites of the one existing political party. But the uh, democratic orientation, the idea that the party is for regular Americans and that uh, an expansive federal government is actually against the interests of uh, regular Americans uh, and that an activist presidency and, uh, is against the interests, uh, largely, of regular Americans, Within the Democratic Republican Party, there begins to develop, especially as the country moves westward and uh, regular Americans are now increasingly becoming not only yeoman farmers, but pioneer farmers, uh, settlers, like that takes, the, these people are a lot more independent, definitely a lot more independent and more uh, uh, sort of uh, oriented towards their own effort and they have uh, this kind of modesty and humbleness. They really are the uber yeoman farmers heading west into the Louisiana Territory that, that Jefferson used his expansive executive power to purchase, there begins to become a division within the only party left, uh, as I think is natural, between these economic elites represented by Jefferson and Madison and their cohorts, the people who used to support the Federalist Party, who don't have any other party to support but the one existing party and are kind of pushing in this direction, and the uh, regular Americans, the frontier Americans, the yeoman farmers, the, essentially the core constituency of the Jeffersonian Madisonian party in the first place, they start to see the world differently. And what happens is the next generation, after uh, the founding generation that fights the Revolutionary War, writes the Constitution, and fights the first political battles during the first two decades of our constitutional history, that generation is replaced by Andrew Jackson's generation, the generation that rises up during the early 19th century, and um, Jeff Jackson himself from a frontier state, Tennessee, and from a frontier area, and himself spends a lot of time on the frontier as a military officer, um, and has that regular person orientation, they start to become dissatisfied with the, we could call it Federalist drift of policy and orientation within the Democratic Republican Party. Um, and there's an internal tension that uh, after the election of 1824, when there are four Democratic Republican candidates who run for office, none of them wins the majority of electoral votes, um, none of them wins the majority of popular votes, Andrew Jackson, the kind of, we could think of him as the populist, uh, 
uh, um, uh, candidate, himself standing for what he thinks of as original Jeffersonian principles. Uh, to him, the Jeffersonian party has drifted from Jeffersonian principles, and I think that he's actually, that's actually pretty accurate. He's representing the constituency of regular Americans. He wins the most votes. He wins the most uh, popular votes and the most electoral votes, but not a majority of either. And then according to the backup mechanism in the Constitution, the House of Representatives chooses the president from among the top uh, two vote getters. They choose John Quincy Adams because the choosers, the members of the House of Representatives, are establishment Democratic Republicans who see things from the, the way that the political elite see things. And they choose from among their membership, John Quincy Adams, the son of the second president, himself not a Federalist, but has that Federalist orientation. And Jackson and his followers are incensed uh, because they believe that, one, they won the election. Like, he had more votes, but, you know, the, he didn't win the election. He, he actually lost, uh, according to the rules at play. What Jackson realized, and his lieutenant Martin Van Buren realized, is that they had more votes. Their constituency was larger. Um, and they, in order to not lose another election, or in order to get the power that they believe they deserved because they supported uh, policies oriented towards the regular Americans, the vast majority of Americans, um, that they had to get organized, form a separate party, and run a campaign that was going to effectively mobilize their core constituency and get the most votes and win the Electoral College outright. And between the election of 1824, where Jackson felt like he got ripped off, and the election of 1828, where Jackson won a resounding victory, Jackson and Van Buren form the modern Democratic Party. Um, and they are actually a much more adept team than Jefferson and Madison, who formed the original Democratic Republican Party with the same orientation of regular Americans, the same orientation against this sort of elitist-oriented uh, opponent, the Federalists. Um, Jackson and Van Buren, because they now actually have more experience with Democratic politics. We're now a whole generation in. We're, several, we're three decades into this experiment. They see how things go. Uh, they uh, essentially develop the entire modern party apparatus as we know it. And it, this is well covered in the reading, so I won't, go over, uh, I won't go over any more than to just say that most of what we recognize in modern campaigning, grassroots organization, county, state, and national uh, integration, party tickets, uh, nominating primaries, uh, or back then they were really they were caucuses, um, uh, simple, simplified campaigning with, with campaign mottos and campaign messages, Gra uh, ground game, trying to get turnout, get your voters to come out, um, the, party, the, the party slate and uh, collective uh, campaigning, all of the things that are really key still to winning elections in the United States were developed by Jackson and Van Buren. And because they had a lot of Americans supporting them, the regular Americans way outnumbered the elites, um, and because voting rights were expanding during this period to include non property owning white men, they weren't expanding beyond white men, but they were expanding beyond the original gen first generation's restrictions on the voters uh, and office holders being property owners, there were way more regular Americans than there were elites. And so the Jacksonian Democratic Party comes to dominate American politics because they have numbers and they have organization. And I think that one of the things that's key about the Democratic Party is that when you represent the regular Americans, when you not, not just represent them, but that's the spirit of your party, you're oriented towards that, you're gonna, going to have superior numbers. Uh, in a democracy, having superior numbers support you in theory isn't good enough. You still have to win the most votes. So uh, Jackson and Van Buren, their, part of their genius was to realize also, like, okay, to get the most votes when you represent a large group of people like that, you actually have to also be organized. Uh, and that's, that's what the party developed to do. That's what modern parties are. Modern parties are uh, organized attempts to appeal to and mobilize as large of a voting coalition as you possibly can. Um, and uh, what happened to the Jeffersonian, Madisonian, the essentially Democratic Republican Party, is that it was caught flat-footed. The, the era of good feelings, where there wasn't party competition, left these political elites incapable of essentially democratic competition. They hadn't really had to compete, and so Jackson and Van Buren and the New Democratic Party just starts kicking butt in terms of uh, uh, national elections and local elections, because they're organized. And it takes several decades, actually, for the economic elites 
who are who uh, um, are represented by originally by the Federalist Party, who came to be represented by the Democratic Republican Party, who will be loosely represented by the Whig Party, which is kind of a transition between uh, the Democratic Republicans and the Republican Party, and then that will become embraced by and organized uh, around the Republican Party. That group of political actors. The, uh, they didn't really have the political skills to outmaneuver the Jacksonian Democrats. And it took a couple of decades for them, essentially, to get their shit together. It took until the 1850s for, the, uh, for a term that's sometimes used in history books, the anti-Jackson party, which went under various names, the Whig party, uh, the Democratic Republican party, later the Republican party, for the anti-Jackson party, the party that represented essentially the old Federalist view, the political and economic elitist view, to get organized enough to compete on an equal basis with the Democratic party. Now, the Democratic party itself, over the course of the following 190 years, uh, has continued to represent this same basic constituency, the regular Americans, right? And, and one of the things that has been problematic for the Democratic Party is that as the American uh, population became more diverse, as it became more spread out, as, as regional differences began showing up, the regular American becomes a more multifaceted group. Uh, there are now different versions of the regular American. And, and one of the things that sort of dooms the Democratic Party during the Civil War and uh, post-Civil War era, where it essentially goes from being the dominant party to being completely eclipsed by the Republicans for several decades, um, several generations even, uh, that uh, the Northern Democrats and the Southern Democrats saw things differently. And then Western Democrats and Southern Democrats and Northern Democrats see things differently. And the Democratic coalition which in Jackson's time was a relatively unified group of people. It was these yeoman farmers. It was these pioneer people. It was, it was uh, um, there, there were workers, of course, but there weren't that many workers. The regular Americans were a relatively homogenous group of people. The Democratic Party's task since the 1850s, really, has been to find a way to hold together an increasingly diverse and contentious coalition of regular Americans. Um, and in the 20th century, that's been particularly, and in the late 20th century, that's been particularly challenging because regular Americans begin to actually have quite different policy orientations on certain core important things. One of the biggest examples, though by far not the only one, of an internal clash is the Democratic Party appeals to pro-environmentalists, people who want a, you know, clean air, clean water, uh, a sustainable future for the earth, and uh, the labor movement, both of which have been key to the democratic coalition. The labor movement has often seen environmental regulations as being uh, counter to labor's interests, and the environmental movement has often seen uh, labor interests as being contrary to the environmental interests. The democratic party has tried to hold both of those groups of regular Americans into their coalition. Um, as the population has become more uh, ethnically diverse, um, the Democratic Party has appealed to uh, beyond more than just white voters. And in order to appeal to more than just white voters, uh, regular uh, um, non-white voters aren't, it's, there's not a unified block of non-white voters for one thing, and also non-white voters and white voters don't necessarily see things the same way. The regular Americans have come to have an increasingly diverse, heterogeneous, and often conflicting perspective. And so the Democratic Party, which has always represented the spirit of the most Americans, the, re the regular Americans, their political challenge, the biggest political challenge, and we're seeing it today, we've seen it pretty much in every generation, is holding together this largely diverse coalition. So the evolution of the Democratic Party has been how to do that. Um, how to, one, you know, like they attempted to hold together the Northern and Southern Democrats prior to the Civil War. That turned out to be impossible. How to rebuild the Democratic Party. What happens in the late 19th century is the Democratic Party is very successful locally in both the North and the South. The Democrats dominate state legislatures in both the North and the South, and, and as well as in the West. But because they don't really have a national identity, they don't have it yet figured out how to hold together this diverse multi-regional coalition of regular Americans, Democrats don't win national elections, and the Republican Party dominates national politics from 1860 through the end of the 1920s. 
Um, most presidents are Republican. There are the occasional Democratic president during that period. Uh, it is far more common uh, during that 60-year uh, um, period, 70-year period, for there to be a Republican Party. Uh, Congress is dominated by uh, Republicans, particularly in, in the uh, House of Representatives. Democrats do really, really well at the local level. And in fact, one of the things that Democrats are able to do during the Progressive Era, from the 1890s through the end of the 19-teens, is to get progressive legislation that benefits workers, that benefits regular Americans, um, through state legislatures. Uh, and uh, that is actually something that uh, kind of allows the Democratic Party under FDR, who looks to build a national coalition out of these different regions, um, he builds on the success of Democrats at the state level and, and draws in uh, still largely a white coalition of voters, though FDR begins the process of assembling a uh, multiracial and multi-ethnic coalition of, of regular American voters. It's always been challenging. It's now challenging not necessarily so much on a regional basis, though regional differences do uh, between regular Americans does provide a challenge to uh, the Democratic Party. It's that the regular Americans, the non-economic, the non-political, the non-cultural elites have a lot of conflicting perspectives. Democrats represent the viewpoint of way more people than Republicans, but sometimes Republicans can peel off either for long periods of time or at least temporarily uh, chunks of the Democratic constituency or the Democratic Party fails to mobilize its full constituency because it has to pick and choose which direction to go and that's going to appeal more strongly to one part of its very much more diverse coalition than to another part. So the Democratic Party represents a larger but more diverse, more contentious, more, intention more internally conflictual coalition and that has been and will always be the central challenge for the Democratic Party in how to translate its essentially broad-based appeal into electoral victory.